And there's there's an escape route just to the right or just to the left or a little modification. And the person says, no, I'm just going to keep doing this thing, smashing my face against the window until I die. Alarm clock in the morning. Are you just like, oh my gosh, snooze, five minutes, ten minutes, I can't take it. And then even then when you have to get up, are you like dragging yourself out of bed? It's not supposed to be like that. That is a sign and that something is not right. Is diagnosis. When you actually look at what that word is, first of all, it has die in it. And the next word that's hidden in there is gnosis. So this inner knowing. Because that's how it happened. But wisdom that change from one reality tunnel to another is rapid. We it have ancient stories that are stored in our salt. And those stories are constantly reaffirmed. I don't we care have ancient what it is. Stories that are... I don't, I trust Heidi and Thaddeus, but I don't, Your I trust Heidi and Thaddeus. Your modern work life is designed to keep you busy. Have you eating foods that make you feel tired, lethargic, and give you just enough energy to feed it to the monster corporation? We're kept moderately sheltered and addictively entertained, and of course passively obedient enough to keep doing it. Do you long for something more but don't know where to start? These corporate escape artists have broken free from the ordinary. They walk unfrequented paths. They break pattern, and they've broken free. Fix your finances, hack your health, and unlearn the lies keeping you stuck in the matrix. Welcome to the Corporate Escape Artists Podcast. Component. <laughs> so everybody kind of ignores that. And so... So when they describe the autonomic nervous system, they're really talking about from the ganglia, which are paraspinal, okay. okay, then out. So they kind of ignore the fact that, uh, I mean, the part I'm gonna show is the sort of the brain of the autonomic nervous system, which is in what's called the reticular activating system of the brain stem. It's the dorsal gray matter that sits at the upper medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Okay, so all of that, is the sort of the control center for the autonomic nervous system. And they've never been able to figure out the neuroanatomy there because there's 80 different nuclei in that gray matter bundle. <laughs> so that's, when you say that's the control system, how does that decide what to control or how to control and all the feedback loops from L, from the peripheral system yeah yeah as well as this further there are central controls as well i mean it, the nervous system is all interconnected but but the the main gateway both ways into and out of comes from that reticular activating system and that's all in the deep brain it's it's in the brain stem okay okay and it's and it's, it's all, it's a gray matter. It's like a little worm in there. And it's on both sides. Okay. Stem. Yeah. And so, and, and so the outflow into the vagus is from both sides. It's not just, it's not unilateral. For sure. Okay. That okay. Sense. And so, but that is, that's the, that's the main outflow of the parasympathetic division of the ANS. There's a sacral outflow that's, you know, so some part does go down the spinal cord, come out to the uh, paraspinal ganglia that are located uh, sacral two, three, and four. Okay. Okay. And then that goes in bladder, sexual organs, you know, that kind of stuff. But the, so then from the upper part of the, of the parasympathetic system, that's going to hit the upper organs? Yeah. Well, it actually, it hits most. And then there's a huge interplay between that coming from the, you know, offshoots from the vagus into the enteric division of the autonomic nervous system. And the, the interplay there is, um, it's imbalanced. There's more parasympathetic effect on the enteric division than there is sympathetic. Really? Well, yeah, because think of it, para, you know, you know sympathetic as fight or flight and there's like rest and digest right? yes and part. so it's digest oh, like digest yeah, right i keep thinking that would be an active like yeah. so I, when i think active i think sympathetic 
but that's actually what happens in the parasympathetic for, stage. Well, yeah, for that aspect. Yeah. Well, and you know, same thing for the sexual aspect. I mean, the, the, the activity is relative. I suppose. Yeah. I, you know. I always think active must mean sympathetic, but that's not true. No, no. I mean, fight or flight, sympathetic. For sure. But yeah. but you know. So what's the most important part of like the Vegas's job? Is it the upper organs because of the heart and the control of like blood pressure and heart? Um, yeah, that's one of the major aspects, but it also affects the bronchi, you know, um, in terms of, you know, opening, closing. It, it affects, um, you know, there's a big impact on the enteric. And so, you know, when you look at... Um, uh, leptin and ghrelin, for instance, those hor the hormonal balance that regulates, you know, hunger, and uh, you know, I've had enough. So I mean, you know, uh, ghrelin comes from the stomach, basically says eat, feed me. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, leptin comes from the adipose tissue in the gut, and it's, it's like I got enough, you know, enough glucose has come in. I don't need it to store any more fat. Stop eating. Okay, stop, stop talking. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get let's going, get going on, on this. On this. Okay. This, is, okay. this is good, but we're not. Yeah, yeah. got it. Right. Yep. So, so, and, and I want to take, take note. So. so, the leptin thing, yeah. not now, but maybe we'll go, we'll get to that because, like, I just did a a huge blood panel, and my leptin was like higher than anyone's ever seen. And I was like, what is happening? So that was like eight weeks ago. So I'm curious, like, how leptin gets high? Why? What would cause it's, it? parasympathetically mediated. So you must get to a point in your meal where you just say, I'm full, mm. and you got still a food on your plate, or you haven't eaten dessert yet, if that's your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and that would make it high? When, you're le when your leptin's it, high, is that? It, it would, would cause, cause those, those things, things to happen. happen. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. okay. It's like, so I've had enough. enough. So stop. Yeah, yeah. Stop. Stop. stop, right. Well, actually, what I learned early in medical school was that 75 to 90 percent of all medical conditions are either caused by or made worse by chronic stress. And so I was fascinated by that whole process. Why are we not treating chronic stress then as a primary pathology? So wait, so, so when you went to medical school it was a little while ago. Yeah. And back then you're saying like 75 to 90 percent due to stress for doctor's visits? Oh, well, and it's the same. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Really? Yeah. I, I talked to a friend of mine at the Mayo Clinic about a month ago, and he's in, he's in charge of functional medicine there. And he says, 99.5% yeah, of the people I see suffer from chronic stress. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. Right. And, and he said, and they're, by the way, mainly executives often they're CEOs. Mm. And so work-related stress in, in the C-suite is very high. Wow. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, as a kid, I, I used to love to go to the pool hall in North Philly. <laughs> And, and uh, on Fridays, I would cut school and, and I'd go there and um, uh, there was always an opportunity to, to you know, play for money. And I was playing this one guy who was a, a drug dealer. <laughs> it wasn't the best of elements. I think so. <laughs> and, um, and, and I was winning. I won four games in a row and he felt like I was hustling him. Mm. And all of a sudden, his friend wasn't there that, that was with him. And I had to, you know, give him a, a change for a 20. And he literally, he was a big guy. And look, I'm not a big guy. And he literally grabbed me around my waist, picked me up. And the bathroom door was right there. Before we got to the bathroom door, it opened. And his friend was standing there with a knife. Okay. And that's called acute stress. That's pretty acute. Not chronic. That doesn't happen to you every day. All right. And so right away everything kicked in adrenaline you know blood pressure goes up breathing goes faster and it was like oh my i've got to get out of this mm. and i brought my hands down on his neck mm. and he collapsed oh my gosh and and we both fell because he li had lifted me up in the air and then he pushed me and i said this is time to let go of the money <laughs> and, and i just let it go but that was acute stress 
extremely important because that's what manifests our survival instinct. Mm. So acute stress is really good for you. It's healthy from that standpoint. Sure. And usually after about two, three, four hours, the problem dissipates. Mm. So it's not chronic, you know, by nature, but it's chronic stress that's problem. So on that acute stress, like I hear like animals will like shake their body and like after they have a stressful situation and encounter with like a predator, a prey animal will kind of like shake it off after they run away and they're free. Then supposedly that like gets rid of that acute stress. Yeah. So like a lot of times you're saying like that goes away, but chronic stress, different. Yeah. Yeah. Chronic stress is very insidious. I mean, if I said to you, Thaddeus, um, what level of stress are you experiencing right now? Five. Okay. Based on what scale? Right. <laughs> it's like a scale I just made up. It's made up. It, exactly. In, in other words, what does zero stress mm. feel like? Mm. And I'm not talking about like drug induced, alcohol induced, anything like that. You're calm. What is zero? What gets you to zero? And what does that feel like? Mm. Very few people can answer that question. I mean, to me, I would, like, I'm younger, I don't have as many worries, not as many responsibilities. I'm sitting on the beach in Hawaii. My parents paid for the trip, so I don't have to worry about that. And I'm just like looking at the waves and like, I don't have any worries. That's good. That's really good. And if you were to take your pulse rate then or your blood pressure, they'd be low, yeah. right? And your breathing would be regular and slow. Your pupils would actually be constricted and you'd be very much at rest and have no feeling that you had to scan the environment for potential danger. So your survival instinct would be low as well, mm. all right? And that's where you want to reside most of the time under any circumstance, other than when you need to have acute stress to get out of a bad situation. Like a good stress, because I think there's almost like there's three types of stress. So there's like a good stress of like, I'm in a survival situation. It's acute stress. It's going to hopefully allow me to live. It's like life or death. I need to like use this adrenaline, all these mechanisms in my body to get free. Exactly. Then there's a chronic stress, which is like, perhaps um, we can talk about this more emotional, more tied into like always being present at some level within your body and within your mind and your, your whole system. But then there's, is there a third stress that's like a hormetic stressor? Like this is a hormetic is like you get this little bit of stress and you get a benefit from it. Is that different somehow from chronic stress? Well, you know, well, you know, you could look at it this way. Let, let's say you've got a work deadline. And so there's a combination of, well, this is not life or death. You know, at the same time, I know I can't be at the beach. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately. So I do have to energize myself. And maybe that's what you're referring to as that middle ground where, you know, I, I need to sort of mobilize my resources so I can get this done. Yeah. And I was also thinking of like uh, you do a cold plunge. So a lot of biohackers right now are into getting cold, whether that's a good idea or not. Their claim is that you get this stressor, the short term stressor of the cold. But the benefit is it provides like increased telomere length, reduced inflammation. So that stressor leads to a benefit, even though the acute stress at the time is harmful to the body in the short term, but the long-term benefits are that you get some sort of physiological long-term benefit from that low amount of stress. Well, yeah, but it's an attitudinal difference. There, you're not in survival mode. Right. And there your intention is, I know I'm gonna put myself through this, which may be a little bit of a shock to the body, but I'm doing it for a reason that's beneficial. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at it from a perspective that this is going to help me. Sure. So in that instance, you're kind of overriding the stress that the cold water is giving you. Because the response would be to get out, right. <laughs> not to stay in there. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. And you had mentioned Philadelphia, so you're East Coaster originally. Yep. Do you think that on the East Coast, there's higher levels of stress than like the West Coast or the mountainous West? Um, well, the West Coast these days, I think is <laughs> problematic with older weather, but- Yeah, there's a um, few other reasons too. Man. Right, yeah, layoffs. Yeah. But um, I, I think 
you know, the East Coast has always been known for a high stress environment, especially when you look at Wall Street yeah. and, and places like that. And, and it still is. I mean, that is high stress. Um, you know, many years ago, the East Coast was more crowded than mm. any other area. So you had greater population density. And so that was problematic in terms of causing stress. Um, but, but in general, these days, I still think there's a lot of stress on the East Coast. There's a lot of stress on the West Coast. And right now, uh, given the, the status of our country, I think this is a lot of stress everywhere. Yeah, that's what I was it's like, it doesn't matter where you are. It seems like there's pockets that have always been, I don't know whether it's the movies that were shown to us when we were kids or whatever, but it's like fast paced East Coast. And I'm from New York originally. So like, I just remember, I moved to Ohio for my first job out of college coming from New York and it was like I'd walk past people on or I'd run I'd go out for a run and people would like stop and say hi to me and I was like why are they talking to me I'm trying to go for a run and they're like hey how's it going I didn't know who they were and it's like in New York you just like you would never do that and so to me it almost seems like the that environment on the east coast is almost like built to be more stressful whether it's just more people but when I moved to the Midwest, people were a little more laid back and they were a little more relaxed. But at least today, what you're saying seems to be accurate. Like I'm seeing high stress everywhere and it's a little more unusual. And I always associate it with like East Coast stress, West Coast laid back. But nowadays, like it just seems like it's all kind of coming together. Yeah. I don't know if you're seeing the same thing that it's like around the board. We're seeing people just have higher levels of stress altogether? Are there anything that you're seeing that would suggest that that's accurate other than subjectively? Oh no, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And if you look at the, st the statistics, it's absolutely the case. Uh, there's a lot more stress uh, around the world. So what's the, like, what is the problem with this chronic stress? Why, why would it be a, a bad thing for people to have just elevated heart rate, higher blood pressure? Like what's that doing to us? Well, it ultimately, it leads to disease. And so what you have with chronic stress is there's more adrenaline through your system, more cortisol. And so that adds um, a lot of stress to the body based on what those different hormones do. And so you're right. With adrenaline, for instance, your heart rate's going to be higher your blood pressure is going to be higher. That leads to heart disease and atherosclerosis. Mm. So right away, greater chance of heart attacks, greater chance of stroke, mm. greater chance of you know, peripheral vascular disease just because of high blood pressure. And again, it's insidious. I mean, this happens over time and it happens gradually so that you don't realize it's occurring. Mm. And then you find yourself on various medications to basically treat these conditions. But again, depending on how well that is treated, the disease can still progress. Mm -hmm. And that's just cardiovascular. I mean, if you look at stress-related illnesses, it gets back to my number of 75 to 90 percent. So this is, this is indeed the major cause of medical problems. It's, it's the biggest cost of healthcare, but it's, it's not calculated that way because we segment it into these different disorders like cardiovascular problems, diabetes, I mean, all these different areas. And then we assign dollar amounts to those. But when you look at the fundamental issue, most of it is caused by stress. So even though there's different ways of naming a disease in the body, ultimately it all comes, not all of it, but majority of it is coming back to the cause of being highly stressed chronically yes. over a long period of time. Absolutely. Do you think that with higher blood pressure leading to potentially things like a stroke or you know heart attack or heart disease, is it because the blood pressure is being forced through arteries in the brain or in the heart that are being constricted from other reasons that are adding to that as well? Well, it's, the constriction usually comes from the activity of the autonomic nervous system. So when the sympathetic division, I mean, there's two major divisions, sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest. When sympathetic is overactive, you not only get increase in heart rate, so it's pumping blood faster. At the same time, you get the arteries often constricting. Mm. And as a result, and, and it does that to get the blood to your muscles. Mm. Again, fight or flight. 
I need high levels of muscular activity. Mm -hmm. So I got to get the pressure, I got to get the oxygen there, I've got to get the blood glucose there to sustain the muscular activity. So that's, that's the predominant activity and that's the reason. But again, your blood pressure is high at that point. If you're living in a state that is sympathetically biased versus parasympathetic, mm -hmm. your blood pressure is gonna be higher. And so you're saying when the, when the heart wants to get the blood further away to the muscles, let's say in the legs or the toes, for whatever reason, if you're gonna run, that the vessels actually constrict and that allows it to force the fluid through much faster when it constricts. And that constriction itself is also dangerous. Right, well, and then in the muscles itself, they may dilate so that you get the blood there and you get the interchange sure. of oxygen and glucose. So all of this chronic stress now, so I mean, it still blows my mind, like 75 to 90% of doctor's visits due to stress being the main cause, even though this is where it does get weird. It's like one of those situations where you look at what are you coming to the doctor for? And you're saying they categorize it. Like I'm coming because uh, I'm not feeling well, or I'm coming because I'm not getting sleep, or I'm coming because my chest hurts. Like all those things can be stress related, but they don't get coded as a stress related dis-ease. Correct. And, and let me clarify the numbers a little bit, because if you're looking at the numbers of visits to primary care physicians due to stress as an underlying cause, then you're at 75 to 90%. If you're looking at doctors in general, the statistics are more like 70 to 80 percent because you have a lot of other kind of doctors that, you know, they wouldn't consider the complaint due to stress. Let's say you're going to a surgeon. It's already been diagnosed as to what the problem is. So those office visits are not related or recovery, you know, processes. Again, the events happened. Yeah, for sure. That still blows my mind that that's that much. And I, it seems like people have been talking about stress for a long time and that it's insidious, that it's a problem. And so it's always been kind of in the vernacular of what I've heard right. my entire work life, but it doesn't seem like we have a lot of good tools to combat stress still to this day. And it's like, doesn't that seem crazy that it's been this long, that stress is an issue, it's responsible for this huge amount of visits to the, the doctor and to the medical system, and yet we're still stressed. Well. You know, I, I had the same thought back when I went to medical school. And I would ask my professors, I said, if this is such a big problem, why aren't we dealing with it directly? And you know what? They had good answers. They said, look, this happens from a part of the brain that we just can't get at easily. We're talking about the brain stem, which is not in the hemispheres. It's in the deep part of the brain. And this is an area that you, you just can't stick a needle in it because you're just as likely to kill the person. <laughs> That'd be no good. Okay. And so number one, you can't deal with it directly. Number two, when the nervous system evolved, it evolves in levels. And this part of the nervous system started to evolve 450 million years ago mm. when fish started to develop organs. Mm. Okay. And you needed an automatic, which is like autonomous mm -hmm. way of regulating those functions. Otherwise, Imagine if you didn't have that, you'd be thinking all the time, oh, how's my liver doing? Maybe I have to change this concentration of this enzyme. You know, what about my kidneys? Okay, so, so all of this happens automatically. This level of regulation began way, way back then, 450 million years ago. Over time, as more of the nervous system started to evolve, there were different layers added when you look at how that happens and what occurs as a result, these new layers have to control more functions. So they have to operate at higher frequency levels. Hmm. Okay. So when you think about that and you say, well, we already have this basic part and we're going to grow that into these other levels. You grow more brain tissue, but they also borrow some of the neuroreceptors from these other areas. So they get spread throughout this newly evolving brain tissue. And so it makes it hard to use a pharmaceutical agent to address stress issues because it will impact so many other parts of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can't go at this part of the brain directly. You can't use drugs to effectively treat it. So in essence, you're left with behavioral techniques like 
relaxation techniques, meditation, biofeedback. But when you look at those techniques, it takes years to become proficient enough where they're meaningful, meaningfully effective. So when you're saying about uh, that part of the brain that regulates the autonomic nervous system, you're talking, you said as we, as we got more complex, <clears throat> the frequencies needed to control it got higher. Does that mean like, are you saying that the, the number of systems that they're controlling at once increased or that the actual like wavelengths being pushed through there in a frequential basis, like the frequency itself, like a sound frequency had became higher? No, it was because <clears throat> because those cells had to do so many more things. Okay, so you know, the those difference. networks. Think of them as networks, because you know it, it's not just one cell does a lot of different things. It's uh, they're called nuclei, which are a collection of cell bodies, and it's all the regulation that occurs between the different nuclei. And for instance, the part of the brainstem that controls the autonomic nervous system, it's a gray matter structure that's in the brainstem, but there's 80 different groupings of neurons, of cell bodies in that structure, and they're all interrelated. They're all giving feedback to one another to regulate this system. Mm -hmm. And so and then there are other systems that impinge on that. So with all of that activity, the frequency of activity uh, basically is much higher. And so when we talk about frequencies, we're talking about regions that are operating many different tasks simultaneously. So they're creating this jumble of, of frequencies as a result. Mm. And that's all being done kind of like behind the scenes of our conscious mind, of course. So like, yeah. I'm not focusing on like trying to breathe. I just, I am breathed by the body. Yeah, think of it like a computer. You know, you might be working on a particular task, a particular app, for instance, that has this set of functions. But underneath that is the operating system of the computer. Mm -hmm. The autonomic nervous system is like the, the operating system. It, and it does so automatically so that consciously you need not be aware of it. So how does that play into to what we were talking about before with the chronic stress, that autonomic nervous system? Because it seems like we're feeding, whether consciously or subconsciously, more inputs to our system saying that there's some sort of threat. Like I've got a project that's late. I need to pay these bills. I, whatever it is, like broke my leg and now I can't get around. And all those stressors add up and add up. Is that also feeding to that autonomic nervous system that causes the downside of chronic stress? Or like how does this, your external environmental stress work with that autonomic nervous system to create like what's happening in the body that we don't want to happen? Well, that's a huge component. And it's not just all the external stresses, okay? Because a lot of people have external stresses, but yet they remain calm. So then you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, why is one person responding differently than another? And so it's how the person adapted to those stressors, mm. and, you know, and that ultimately determines it. And that's why things like meditation and relaxation exercises can work to reduce stress. So it, it, it's a combination of what's happening in my world but what's happening inside my world. For sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I, and I wonder if it's like, is it all adaptation to stress or is it the way people have both adapted because they've been stressed enough to know how to deal with it or have those people just learn techniques to deal with their stress where other people weren't taught any techniques? Is it, or is it both? Well, it can be both, but in most instances, we don't develop the defenses against stress or, or the, the way in which we can approach stress until we've had enough stress to learn that we have to deal with it. You know, human beings are like that. <laughs> we, we don't develop new capabilities unless we're kind of forced to. And, Seems like it. Yeah, and this is one of those examples where it's like, I don't want to live like this anymore. So therefore, I have to be different and respond differently to my environment. A lot of times it's just simply saying no. I am not going to do this now. I have this to do now. When I get done this task, I will move to that task. Yeah, the multitasking is huge right now, especially with the smartphones where everyone's constantly distracted with what they're wearing on their wrist, the dings, the notifications, the looking at every single message and trying to be in a meeting and trying to do whatever else they're doing, be with their kids. You know, it's, it's kind of insane these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So there's way, I feel like that's part of the reason why there's more stress is because like my personal opinion, these smartphones, I don't like to call them smartphones, but they seem to be getting smarter than sometimes the, the people using them are. So we have all these distractions that are growing. And what I'm noticing, and I think what my family notices is like people around us have a lot more stress, anxiety, and insomnia. Like those are the main things that we hear about all the time from everybody that we know. So like, because of all that stuff that's being added to our systems, like does that chronic stress have an impact on sleep at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, in my opinion, it's probably the biggest problem in terms of poor sleep. Uh, for several reasons. One is it oftentimes makes it harder to fall asleep because you've got the chronic stress and you haven't learned how to turn it off. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you go to bed and it's still there. And so you're still thinking about things. You're still in your head worrying about what am I going to do tomorrow or the bills haven't been paid or I haven't gotten this project done and my boss is going <laughs> to not like that. And so all of these problems add up and it prevents you from falling asleep. But the same thing happens in the middle of the night. I mean, as we get older and we lose deep sleep, we're more prone to wake up. And if we wake up a little bit too much <laughs> and we start thinking again about all these stressors, then it gets hard to fall back to sleep and we may not be able to fall back to sleep at all. Mm. So then you don't get enough dream sleep because most of your dream sleep happens later in the night. So it, it's, a, it's a real conundrum. And I would say, I mean, as a physician, I would say that chronic stress is more problematic than lack of sleep. Mm. But the two are so interconnected that it's really a, a vicious circle because if you end up having stress that prevents sleep and then you're tired, you're more likely to be predisposed to greater stress. And so things just get worse and worse. Exactly. And it, it seems like when you finally lay down at night for most people, that's when their phone gets well, probably not turned on airplane mode, although ours does <laughs> and put away, but most people put their phones down at least. And so now that they're not distracted, all the worries and all the other things that they should have probably been thinking about during the day, they kind of flood in. And so then what I'm seeing is that creates like a ton of insomnia because now people's brains are just spinning and spinning and spinning and they, their heart rate's going up and they're not falling asleep. Right. And then often what I experience, not me personally, but when I talk to other people is then they'll reach for their phone. And then they're looking at you know a message or a notification and then they become less sleepy and less sleepy and more anxious a lot of times because now they've got a notification of like, what's going on tomorrow? What's your calendar notification say? Mm -hmm. And then I assume when they wake up in the middle of the night, the same thing. It's like they wake up at the night, they wanna see what time it is. And most people use their phones for clock. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what time is it? And look at all the notifications I have on my phone now that I should look at. And so now they're just pulling themselves further out of sleep, increasing their stress. And it just seems like what you're saying is like this crazy cycle. So what, you're, what you said though, is that the more important component to focus on first is the stress. And you and you're saying like, are you are you, is that what you're saying? And are you saying that stress reduction is probably more important to focus on first rather than fixing your sleep? Uh, that's what I believe. I, I and I think there's you know ample evidence to show that based on, upon the fact that stress causes so many problems, um, as opposed to sleep, which also causes you know a huge number of problems. But if I had to rank the two, stress is worse. And, and again, what I mean by stress is chronic stress. And so you have to find a way to deal with that, n number one. And, you know, and the, men the, the problems you just mentioned about you know, checking all the notifications and oh, I'm worried about you know, X, Y, and Z. You know, one of the things to do before you go to bed is, and preferably an hour or two before you go to bed, is make a list of all the things you have to do and then say, I'll do these in the morning. <laughs> you, know, you know, train yourself to say, now is not the time to worry about these tasks because I can't do anything about them now. Mm -hmm. And now is when I need to sleep. So write them all down. That way you don't have to worry about forgetting them. Say, they're there. I'll wake up in the morning, I'll see them, I'll get them done. Okay, I'll address them then, not now. Um, that's one key mechanism. The other is 
when we are stressed out, where are we? Where, 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 where is our attention? It's here. It's in our thinking brain. And it's usually in the future too. Yes. We're not present centered and we're certainly not body centered. Mm. So I tell people that when you get into bed, you have to get out of your head. You really need to focus on your body. And I, I tell people to start with the feet, mm. you know, and you know, a lot of people will say, you know, learn how to breathe differently. Focus on your breath and, and try to slow down and breathe regularly. Um, I, I found that just as often what happens is people then get worried and get stressed out over, oh, my, my, breath, my breathing rate is not good enough or I'm breathing too deeply or this or that. And they start thinking about how they're going to control their breath. And so I make it simpler. I just tell them, focus on your feet and try to feel your feet. Mm. And, and when they do that, it, it takes them a while to say, yeah, okay, I can feel my feet now. And they might feel a particular sensation or not, but at least they're out of their head. And it's much easier to fall asleep when you're focusing on your feeling, you know, and, and I, I, I term that in general, one's feeling nature. You want to make it more body centric. You want to be present in your body, not just stuck thinking in your head. I think that's huge because I have heard about breathing techniques. I've heard about supplements to take before sleep. Um, but I've not heard anyone other than you talk about getting into your body and starting with the feet. I think that's really interesting. Is there something with the feet, Dan, that like you have people focus on there? Is there a reason that you're doing that? Well, you know, you know, we have a technology and so, you know, uh, and we place that technology by the feet. So that's, so that's Soltech, right? This yes. Soltech and it, and when I was introduced to this technology, I was introduced to it as like something that helps with sleep. And when you first let me experience it, it was during the middle of the day, it was like 3 p.m. And my wife Heidi and I got to, we put our feet near it. And then we just kind of relaxed. And I was almost thinking like, oh, I'll try to do a meditation. And quickly I was like, oh my gosh, I could feel sensations in my feet, which was really interesting because I was up in my head and I'm like, I feel something in my feet. Like I can actually feel something. And I got really relaxed. So I was like really impressed just the fact that I could feel something and it relaxed me. It didn't make me, you know, more excited or like uh, something that would make me just like have a sympathetic response, which is typical for electrical devices. And it was in my feet. So I think that was the interesting part. And I was under the assumption it was for sleep. But when I used it, like we both got into this really relaxed state. I was like, oh my gosh, somebody could use this for meditation. So can you talk about the Soltech piece of equipment that you invented and like, what does that do? And we were talking about the feet. So like, what do, what do the feet have to do with it? Um, <clears throat> there's several reasons we put it by the feet, but it's a great place to start because it's so far removed from your brain. <laughs> so, and so people, people are immediately, why is he telling me to focus on my feet? And one of the things that happens is we, we use magnets, the real magnets, not, it's not electromagnetism, and we run them at extremely low frequencies. And that stimulates part of the nervous system that causes a, a general sensation. And it does this through what the, our National Institute of Health calls the biofield, okay? Back in 1991, NIH formed um, the Office of Alternative Medicine. And in 92, they coined the term biofield. And this was akin to um, what the Chinese call qi or Japanese ki, mm -hmm. or in Ayurvedic medicine, it's prana. So, you know, however you want to relate it, it's this massless energetic field. And we know from experiments that we've done is that magnetism interrelates with that field. And then that field interrelates with the nervous system in the body. And so by stimulating that field, it causes a sensation. And since we put it by the feet, that's where you feel it first. Mm. And so for most people, they feel this gentle tingling sensation. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a subtle vibration. Some people feel it as warmth. 
Some few people feel it as a pressure sensation, but however they feel it, it immediately draws their attention. And as a result, they're not thinking anymore. They're feeling, and that's a big difference. So they start to feel it. And then usually that sensation starts to move up the legs. And typically, and this surprises a lot of people, by the time it reaches the knees or it gets close to the knees, they're already feeling it in their hands. Mm. And it's like, why is that? <laughs> and again, it's because of this bio field. And then with practice, and not even really practice, just with use, that feeling spreads throughout the whole body so they can feel their whole body. So for instance, you know, I've been using this technology for about five years now. As soon as I get in the bed and turn it on, it's like my whole body feels this way. I immediately am out of my head and I'm usually asleep in five minutes. Wow. Right, simply because again, my attention is directed outside of the thinking brain. Okay, and it's time for bed. You know, I, I like to go to bed about the same time every night. So my body's used to that rhythm. And so I fall asleep. But the same thing happens, you know, I'm old enough now where I typically have to take one or two trips to the bathroom at night, okay? And it used to be uh, before using this technology, before I, you know, had my delta sleep back, my deep sleep, uh, I would get up and I'd be awake. Now I'm tired enough, I get back into bed and the same process happens. I focus on my body, boom, asleep. Mm. And so it, it's, a, it's a huge deal to not be up here at night. For sure. So is the whole purpose of the device just to give you a sensation in your feet and then your legs to help you get out of your head? Or is it doing something else to help you with sleep? No, you know, you're right. There's, there's a lot more to it than that. That's, that's one of the, what we call a side benefit. Okay. The real uh, reason we do it is because uh, in our research, we've learned that the part of the brain that controls sleep in its stages operates at specific frequencies. Okay. And they're, they're very slow frequencies. They're lower than brainwave frequencies. And because we can put this system by your feet, this magnetic generator by your feet. We know when you're moving into different stages of sleep because we have a wearable that in real time determines what stage of sleep you're moving into. Mm. And this is, we call this real time sleep stage enhancement. So as you're moving, for instance, into deep sleep, the wearable notices that, hey, we're going deep. The brain wants to go into deep sleep now. So it tells the generator using Bluetooth technology, it takes about a second, and it, it says, run the protocols to produce frequencies associated with this person's deep sleep. And so then the generator does that. That travels you know, throughout this biofield, ultimately influencing, or I should say supporting what the brain really wants to do at that point to produce the frequencies that are consistent with that part of the brain causing that level of sleep. And so it's really a frequency generator that affects that aspect of sleep. So it's determining that through the wearable that you're getting into deep sleep yourself and then it's feeding back and you said your frequency of deep sleep, are there, do people have different frequencies that they go into deep sleep at in their brain? Yeah, they're very slightly different, you know, across individuals and, and what we do with the system in the first few nights of use, we run through a calibration process to learn what's right for the, per, for the person. And then we use those frequencies. And then every few weeks, you know, automatically it's doing checks to see are they still performing as well as they need to? Can they be performing a little bit better in these stages of sleep? And then it will make these adjustments. Again, this is like your autonomic nervous system. It's, you're not consciously aware that this is happening. And it makes these adjustments to essentially improve upon your sleep patterns. When you say improve upon, does that mean like, from what I've heard, so deep sleep typically happens, this is just my understanding of it, earlier in the night. So let's just say from nine to 11. 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Let's say that's like the peak time for deep sleep based on what I've read. And if that's the case, 
during deep sleep, we're getting like physical repair, rejuvenation, like it's the physical body portion where REM would be psychological, at least from my, my understanding of how I read it. So it seems like I want more deep sleep rather than less because the, the more deep sleep I get, the more rejuvenation I would achieve at night. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, our sleep is broken into what are called sleep cycles. And on average, you know, across humans, the average sleep cycle time is about 90 minutes. And in that 90 minute cycle, you move from, you know, wake or in the beginning, you'll move from wake into light sleep, into deep sleep, and then to dream sleep. And then the cycle repeats, hopefully without you waking up each time, okay? So that you'll move from dream sleep, let's say for the second cycle, into light sleep, deep sleep, and then, you know, dream sleep again. And you'll cycle like that. There is a bias, as you mentioned. So in the earlier sleep cycles, you're gonna get more deep sleep and less dream sleep. And in the later sleep cycles, you get less deep sleep or maybe none you know, after, you know, when you're in their fourth or fifth cycle and you'll get more dream sleep. So you're right, there's a bias, more deep sleep early in the night, more dream sleep late in the night. And so those early cycles, very important for deep sleep, which is also known as delta or slow wave sleep. And the reason, as you mentioned, that that sleep is so important is because it is rejuvenative, right? It is that stage of sleep that sends out 80% of your growth hormone to repair and regenerate tissues, particularly muscle, cartilage, th those kinds of tissues, and very, very important for that. But it also is very beneficial for prolonging sleep, all right? There's, there's a phenomenon called sleep inertia. And sleep inertia basically means when I get enough deep sleep, it's more likely to keep me asleep for the rest of the night or if I do wake up to, let's say, go to the bathroom, I will be able to fall back to sleep because I will have those feelings of fatigue. It's also one of the reasons why when you get enough of that deep sleep early in the night and you don't need to get any more later in the night, you don't wake up drowsy, <laughs> okay? And because you've already had enough. And so it, and when you wake up out of deep sleep, you are drowsy, which is good if it's early because you wanna be able to get back to sleep, all right? So all of that's very important, and you're also correct. The dream sleep is very important for emotional health, and, and it has a number of other you know, uh, important features to it, but that's one of the big ones. And so when you look at sleep overall, the whole concept of lengthening sleep to normal levels is very important because, again, there have been numerous medical studies performed that have been done longitudinally. These studies were done on, and collectively, on hundreds of thousands of subjects and over 20, 30 years. And what they've determined is that if you're sleeping, and this is sleep time, not time in bed, but if you're sleeping less than six hours a night, you're gonna have a much greater chance of developing all sorts of medical problems you know, dementia, I mean, Alzheimer's disease, for instance, cancer, you know, prevalency goes up by 40%. You gain weight, so obesity can be a problem. Diabetes, like all the complications of diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So all of those issues occur. Now, th there is one thing to notice uh, about studies. These studies, since they lasted for 20, 30 years, obviously they started more than 20, 30 years you know, before now, mm -hmm. right? Back then, there weren't wearables. We weren't measuring these things every night. And a lot of times, it was just self-report. How long did I sleep? Well, if most people said, well, you know, if I go to bed at 11 o'clock and I wake up at 7, I slept for 8 hours. <laughs> and what we found with all these wearables is, you know, your sleep time is actually typically about an hour less than the time of the recording. So if you were thinking that, you know, I go to bed at midnight and I wake up at six, well, that's six hours of sleep, right? No, chances are it might be five. So then, you know, I don't know if the thresholds that have been set in terms of you need at least six hours to avoid these medical problems, 
maybe it's five. We don't really know that. Science hasn't addressed that yet. It brings up a lot of questions that I have around whether they were recording deep sleep and REM, and if you get enough of those two, can you get less total time asleep? But I wanted to ask a question before that, which is, does the technology developed lengthen the time asleep, or does it increase deep or REM sleep? Is it, does it help with any of those things? Yeah, uh, great questions. Um, it does all three of those things, but for different reasons, <laughs> okay? Um, one is, uh, a lot of people like to look at total sleep. They say, I feel good in the morning if I slept for seven, eight hours, all right? Well, one of the problems as we get older is we lose deep sleep. It's, it's just a fact of life, you know? Our, our, our peak deep sleep is when we're infants. You know, 90% of our sleep then is deep. So let's say by the time you get to 18 or 20, you know, you might have, let's say, hour and 45 minutes, two hours of deep sleep. So let's call that for the moment ideal. Right? Even by the time you've gotten into your mid to late 40s, you've already lost 60 to 70% of that deep sleep. That's a big difference. This is why you start waking up. I mean, when you look- Is this why we age? <laughs> We're not getting the reparative sleep? Well, well, in part, yeah. And so by the time you're 70, 80, you may not have any deep sleep at all, mm. okay? And so the sleep is very fragmented. And as you look at that loss of deep sleep, it correlates directly with how long you're sleeping because you don't have that sleep inertia. Mm. And as a result, you know, you may only be getting four or five hours a night. I, I suffered from that. When, when I reached my mid-60s, my deep sleep had diminished significantly. So I, I would typically get up to go to the bathroom after about three hours of sleep. I got to the point where I'd go to the bathroom and I'd say, I'm so wide awake at this point. I ended up giving up, saying I'm not even going to bother trying to go back to sleep because I'm just so wide awake. And so I'd get up and I'd start working. And, and it was three, four cups of coffee a day and occasional naps, you know, to get through. It, that, you know, you can't tell me three or four hours is good enough. It's not. And everybody knows that. And all the science shows that. So uh, I was, was like, I've got to do something for this. Fortunately, we had been working on this technology. And, and as we refined it further, it got to the point where, okay, we can actually restore deep sleep mm -hmm. because we, we, know, we know the patterns and the frequencies that are associated with deep sleep. And therefore we could support the nervous system that still wanted to go there, but for, for reasons, whether it be cell loss or just dysfunction, it just wasn't getting there anymore. And so as I started to get more deep sleep, again, sleep inertia kicked in and so it was now lengthening my sleep period, mm. okay? Well, since most of the REM sleep occurs late in the night, dream sleep, because I'm sleeping longer, now I'm getting more dream sleep again, mm. all right? So the whole thing, all the three things you mentioned, you know, increase in deep sleep, dream sleep, and sleep longer, all of them were happening at this point, but it really stemmed from getting more of that deep sleep, which we lose as we age. So you were saying you were getting like three hours of sleep for quite a while. Yeah. And when you started using the technology that you invented, I'm sure you were one of the first people to try it out, right? So yeah. you've probably been using it the longest. Yeah. So where are you right now in your sleep? Like how long are you sleeping? Are you getting more deep sleep than you were before? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm averaging now an hour and a half of, of deep, deep sleep, sleep a night. Yeah, and I was probably, you know, in, in my early 60s, I was probably getting 15 to 20 minutes. Now I'm getting 90 minutes. Uh, I'm sleeping like a 25-year-old yeah. now, okay? And so, and, and again, just as you said, I'm getting most of that early in the night. And that is allowing me to sleep longer. Now for me, I've never been a long sleeper. Uh, I've always been one of these people who would shut their eyes, go to sleep, wake up and it's morning, and, and it was never, it, it wasn't the typical eight hours, you know? I mean, when you look at 
how long people sleep in general. It's a bell-shaped curve. It's not like everybody sleeps eight hours, all right? And, and so, you know, it's typically between six and 10 hours with a, a peak at, let's say, eight or seven and a half, all right? And so I was always on the short end. And then medical training really hurts in that process because in medical training, you go through internship residency, you have to be on call for 36 hours. You literally end up training yourself to get by with less sleep. And unfortunately, that problem persists often. And so for me, six and a half to seven hours is my typical sleep time. And, and I do quite well at that as long as I'm getting a good amount of, of deep sleep. And what happens because my sleep is more compressed, I also get a fair amount of dream sleep in that time. So I feel good when I get up after six and a half, seven hours, I feel great. Because you've had all the stages where before you were getting up to use the bathroom, right. probably didn't fall back asleep, not getting any REM sleep or dream sleep at right. all. And, and what I've heard is like, you said there's a lot more to it, but psychological repair and consolidation of memory and all these things happen during REM. Exactly. So imagine like Alzheimer's and dementia, if you're not getting the REM sleep, you're not consolidating that memory to go into your long-term or even short-term memory. Well, and, and they've lost so much of their deep sleep that they're not going to get there. Yeah. So th that's really problematic. But there's another, another factor that, um, you know, unfortunately the medical community has not really addressed. That is about half of your night is spent in what's called light sleep. And light sleep is everything from drowsiness <laughs> when you're awake and you slide into drowsiness to the light sleep hasn't quite reached deep sleep. Well, that's a, that's a huge, you know, bandwidth there, yeah. <laughs> you know, in terms of, wait a minute, if, if I, does it make a difference if that 50% 50 of my sleep, of, you know, that light sleep is in drowsiness versus almost delta or deep sleep? Well, of course. And so people haven't taken the time to quantify that and so we've developed a metric in our system that looks at non-REM sleep quality. In other words, light and deep sleep, but looking at the whole thing and saying, how deep is all of that? Because that should be 75% of your night. So that's the majority of your night. You want an index that says, hey, where, does, where am I? In, because I could, I could have one night, maybe I have you know, 25% in deep sleep. But what if I'm off a little and I'm only getting 15%, but the other 10% is like almost there. You know, you want to know, you know, you don't want that number to fluctuate. You want to really have an understanding of how did that 75% of my night, you know, how was I behaving? How was my brain behaving? And so it's important to basically look at non-REM sleep in a more granular fashion so you have a better estimate of how overall deep my non-REM sleep is. Mm. There seems like there's a lot of stages of sleep we're missing and we're focused on like four. It's like light sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, and sort of awake. Mm -hmm. And those are the stages, but there's probably more stages that might be significant we haven't even studied yet, yeah. which is why like the overall length of sleep might be so important. And it's like, hey, if I got an hour and a half of deep and two hours of REM, I can be done with like four and a half hours of sleep. But because maybe we haven't studied what happens for that other time asleep for the, the rest of the six or eight hours like maybe there's a lot more to it that is responsible for health and aging and all sorts of things well there, there can be or you can also look at it another way and that is some of these long sleepers may be sleeping long because their sleep isn't very good mm -hmm. True. <laughs> and therefore they spend so much more time in bed again what what you're referring to is yeah maybe i can compress my level of sleep if the quality is better mm -hmm. It certainly can't hurt, but I, you know, but there is a point where you don't want to c compress beyond, you know. But again, that hasn't been studied well because we haven't had the tools to quantify this on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. Nobody's been able to look at this over decades and really assess how important sleep quality is, not just consolidation, but the depth of, of all of non-REM sleep. So if you, so you've got this technology, Soltech, and if you are a user of that technology, like, are there ways to dial in your sleep? Like, so if I'm a user, I'm, I've got the device, I have the wearable, is there a way to dial in my sleep to make it better each night? Or is it just plug and play? I put it on, it does everything for me. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's really automatic. 
So it's going through all of those steps. Um, we do have a way on the stress part of the uh, application to do some dialing in and, and to do some fine tuning. And, and that's really interesting because, you know, as we discussed a, a few minutes ago, we have a spectrum on that autonomic nervous system in the brainstem where some people operate at certain levels and the more hypervigilant you are, the more you're scanning the environment for potential danger, you might be operating at a lower level closer to the sympathetic range, okay? Because the sympathetic frequencies are a little lower than the parasympathetic frequencies. And you'd love to be operating, you know, deep into the parasympathetic range. And that's where you're gonna get the, the most efficacious sleep. All right, you're more likely to produce more delta sleep at those levels if you're operating at those levels. Mm. To operate at those levels though, as we discussed again before, you wanna eliminate stress, <laughs> okay? And so that's excellent, but if you're, if you're low down, then your sleep quality overall is not gonna be as good because you're, you're in essence a little bit more stressed even though you're asleep. So, well, so you're saying, number one, you wanna operate from a, a higher parasympathetic state and that leads to better sleep, but it also leads to probably better life overall because of all the dis diseases that are related to stress. Exactly. And you had said something about like the Soltec system that you invented, it's used for sleep, but you're starting to say like you can use it for stress and there's a way to, to adjust more with the, the stress response. So like, how do you use the system to combat stress? Well, we have, we have settings already programmed in that accommodate most people, okay? But the bandwidth of those settings in terms of the frequencies that it administers is fairly broad. So it's gonna catch most people for some of the time. But if you dial it in a little bit more, then you could narrow the bandwidth to hit the frequencies that are more important to you. In other words, it meets you closer to where you are at. Mm. And that will help you de-stress faster, mm. okay? And, and so we give you that capability of, of tuning. And what you have to do is essentially use it the way it is, the way it's already been programmed. And then if you're not getting the kind of response that you think you should be getting, then those frequencies can be adjusted so you can be in control of that process to see, you know, if I move it down a little, is that going to meet me closer to where I'm at? And what we found in, in our work with people is that people that are more hypervigilant, where, you know, whether they've had trauma as a younger person or PTSD or things like that, they're, again, they can only feel safe and secure if they are scanning the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that's important to them. They feel the need to do that. And so we have to meet them at a lower frequency and that will help get them more relaxed. What we don't know at this point is over time, will that frequency migrate once they are less stressed? That's something that we're interested in learning about over the next year or so. Seems like, Seems like it definitely would. You're, you're kind of resetting that, um that signal. So are you saying that that's automatic? So if I'm, if I'm someone that has had trauma and I'm a more vigilant than other people, is it gonna automatically adjust to me to help lower that frequency I need for sleep? The automatic adjustments only happen in the sleep mode. Okay. They don't happen in the stress mode. In the stress mode, you can make the adjustment anytime you want. Oh, how do you, so, so there's a stress mode for the device. Yes. So I can use it anytime during the day when I'm not sleeping and there's a separate setting. So I'm a little bit familiar with the app, but there's a separate setting for like a relaxation session. Mm -hmm. So what's happening during that session and like, how can you tailor those frequencies? Well, there's a certain set of commands, you know, uh, there's a little bit of a trap door. Okay. So we, we have to teach people how <laughs> so to do know. that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, it's hidden for the moment, but you know, when people call customer support, then we take them through the process mm. so that they can start playing with that. Um, the reason we don't um, do that from the get-go is the way it's now, most people respond to it, and therefore there's no reason to go there. 
But if they don't respond, then we want to help them get there. So I noticed, Dan, that it took about six weeks of me using the system before I noticed a real change in my deep sleep. And in fact, like my REM sleep exponentially increased as well. Is that pretty typical that it takes more than the first time you use the system to get a big benefit or a noticeable change? Uh, absolutely. First of all, in the very beginning, for, for the first few nights, we go through a calibration process to learn where your frequencies are at so we know how to supply the right frequencies. But then again, when you think about how your sleep is, um, if, if you're using it as a younger person and you, you're a performance maximizer, you've already got all the circuitry in place. So you may have an immediate response. It may be very, very fast, especially if you're in your 30s. You know, then, then the response is going to be fast. But we have a lot of users that are in their 70s and 80s, and their sleep patterns have been so disruptive, and they've lost so much deep sleep, they've, and it's been due to loss of circuitry because that circuitry hasn't been used. And so, it, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's really true. Um, but the brain is dynamic and those circuits can be restored. And so what we found is depending on how bad your sleep is, it can still be fixed, but it just takes longer. And we've seen some people have um, improvement, but it, it's taken two to three months before they'll have improvement. So it, it can take that long uh, before there's substantial improvement. It makes me feel like I'm one of the people that had sleep that was so bad for so long, so it took six weeks, not the first time. Um, but my, like I was saying before, my deep sleep, it went from 20 to 30 minutes to an hour and a half to two hours, which was massive. I mean, I used to track my sleep all the time and nothing that I could do would get my sleep to that hour and a half, two hour point until I started using this and, it, and the, the six weeks of time that it took, I was like, oh, is this gonna work for me? It's not working. And then all of a sudden I just see sleep, deep sleep scores of an hour and a half and REM up to like four hours in a night, which was huge. I've never seen those numbers. And I did this experiment unintentionally where I unplugged the device to see if I would get better sleep with or without the device. And it was unintentional because I had unplugged it to plug in a vacuum or something upstairs and I thought I plugged it back in. So I went to bed and I woke up and I was like, why is my deep sleep like 30 minutes? This is crazy. It's usually an hour and a half. So I went to sleep the next night and it was 25 minutes. And I'm like, something's wrong here. So I get up the next day after the 20 minute, 25 minute deep sleep and I look around and the, the unit, I never plugged it back in from unplugging it from the vacuum. I plugged it back in that day. I went to sleep hour and a half deep sleep that night. So I've now done that experiment unintentionally three times. So the other time it just happened to come unplugged at the poor brick and I didn't know it had come unplugged. The dog, you know, must've done something and unplugged it. I didn't know my deep sleep decreased. I plugged it back in the next night, my deep sleep went back up. So this was like a blind trial for myself because I didn't know it was unplugged. And every time it was unplugged, I saw a drop in my deep sleep. And every time I plugged it back in, that deep sleep went up three to five times. I mean, that was massive for me. Is that is that pretty common, like that you've seen other people do that? Or am I the only one that keeps unplugging my device? Well, I've got two points to make about that. Um, one is a little bit different in that we've had a number of people who've been using the device. It's become very successful. And then they go on vacation. Mm. and. Uh, what I've heard, particularly with extended vacations, people, by the time they get, you know, a few nights away from it, they notice that their sleep is starting to degrade. By the time they get to three weeks, they're back to where they were at the beginning. Mm. And the first night back, there's huge rebound. I mean, one of our board members was away for six weeks the first night back, he had four hours and 36 minutes of deep sleep. Whoa, <laughs> that's <laughs> unheard of. Right, I mean, that's rebound. The other thing I wanna say is um, a lot of people, particularly with age, if they're not exercising regularly, they won't have the consistent results you have. Uh, and I'm a good example. If I'm not exercising, 
I might have a couple good nights and then they're good enough where all of a sudden the third night, not so good. And then a couple good nights and then, you know, the pattern will repeat. So I won't have consistent results night after night. However, on average, I'll get about an hour and a half. And my bad nights aren't bad enough to have bad daytime effects. Okay, so, so that inconsistency is there. If I want to sleep like a 20 year old, I have to act like a 20 year old, which means I've got to be active every day. Mm -hmm. Recently, um, you know, we're in the process of moving. And so I got a 20 yard dumpster and I filled it myself over two weeks. So I was working really hard. In that instance, I was like a 20 year old. Every night was good. Do you think that's because if you're not exercising all the time, your body doesn't need as much deep sleep? Exactly. I mean, your, your muscles say, hey, you know what? I'm in need of repair and rejuvenation. Send me the growth hormone. Let's get going, nice. you know? And so it's telling the brain, I need that sleep. And so uh, I got it. And, and during those weeks, I averaged about an hour and 45 minutes, wow. you know, of deep sleep. So it was higher than normal, again, because of the exercise. So Dan, you also mentioned earlier that the system is constantly taking in user data. So people like me who I'm sleeping with the system and it's gathering this data on how well I'm sleeping and what's working. You had said something about like over time, the algorithms that you're using are getting better. Like how, how does that work and what are you guys doing with that data? Well, we use that information to help us refine the system. And what we've learned, you know, in part was not everybody responds to the same degree. And that was a little perplexing because we're dealing with a part of the nervous system that's so old, you'd think it would be about the same in everybody. And what we realized is people are operating at slightly different frequencies. And so we realized we had to customize the frequencies that we were giving each person. And that was a big breakthrough for us. And we went through that process of changing the algorithm. Um, there are also some processes that are built into the hardware that we're not yet using for the customers. And we're still doing experimentation. Everybody has it built in. And so one day there'll be a release that starts using some of these features that can produce multiple other frequencies simultaneous. Because what we've learned in this process, deep sleep is a good example, there are several levels of deep sleep. And when we move into deep sleep, we are using one protocol that deepens that level. Then once you're in deep sleep, there's another protocol that we use to deepen it even further. Okay. Well, they're different frequencies. Wouldn't it be better if we could sort of run those frequencies simultaneously? And right now we've got two magnets so we can create two different frequencies at the same time. Plus the difference between those frequencies creates a beat frequency, so there's three. But we also have a mechanism to create two more primary frequencies, and that's, that gives us four primary frequencies, which gives us six beat frequencies. So then there's 10 frequencies overall. And so that would give us enough to both do the uh, moving into deep sleep and, oh, I'm gonna blend that with, I'm gonna deepen it even further at the same time because what we see that as we move into the later sleep cycles, like three and four, where you're still getting some deep sleep, wouldn't it be nice to also make them a little deeper? Mm -hmm. You know, again, all of these refinements over time add up. So it sounds like as more people use the system and you get more information, the system gets better over time. So it's like a constantly evolving system that makes everyone who's in a community of users better and better. Is that, yes. is that accurate? Yeah, we've been, we've been refining both the staging algorithm as well as the, the uh, therapeutic benefits, uh, again, based on data. So then we're talking about sleep and stress, and I was thinking about like in a sleep lab. So when you go into a sleep lab and they're putting these electrodes on your head, I mean, what, what are they measuring with those in the sleep lab? Are they measuring that autonomic, automatic nervous system? Or like, what's the deal with those electrodes and, and how are they getting their data? Yeah, it's, you know, it's confusing because sleep labs operate so differently than these wearables, for instance. When you look at what the sleep lab measures for sleep staging, for instance, 
They're, they've got electrodes on your head to measure brain waves. They've got electrodes around your eyes to look for eye movements. Because mm. when you get drowsy, you have slow rolling eye movements. When you have dream sleep, you have eye movements. And then there's electrodes that are underneath your jaw that are actually measuring the level of muscle activation in your tongue muscle, okay? Because what happens during um, dream sleep and also to some extent during deep sleep, there's a reduction in muscle tension. And all of those signals, brain waves, eye movements, chin muscle activity, all of those metrics are used to stage sleep, hmm. okay? Well, when you have a wearable, you're not measuring brain waves, <laughs> you know, eye movements, chin muscle activity, none of that's happening, all right? So how does it get its data? And it uses heart rate variability because there's a correlation between what's happening with these metrics and heart rate variability. But unfortunately, because a lot of people think about, well, you know, I go to a sleep lab and they're measuring my brain and they're measuring the cerebral cortex and no neurologist walks into one of these meetings without their brain. So, so, <laughs> Always have so, your brain in hand. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna show you. So, so this is the cerebrum right here. And so when you put electrodes on the surface, you're measuring the electrical activity here. So okay. you're measuring. And is that like one of the hemispheres of the brain? Yeah. Is that both? Brain, yeah, that both? yeah, this is the hemisphere. We're only looking at half a brain, so there would be another one here, all right? And so brain waves come from this area. So it's easy to think that, well, this is what drives sleep. Sure. And so the answer is no, not really. Mm. This is what reflects the driver of sleep. In other words, this is not the pacemaker of sleep. The pacemaker of sleep is right here in, in the brainstem area, in what's called the reticular activating system. It's the head of the autonomic nervous system. This drives sleep and it also is what regulates stress. Hmm. So when, when we started our company to solve the stress issue, and when we did that by essentially supporting activity of the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, we didn't realize that, oh, you know what? The same frequencies that produce deep relaxation also produce deep sleep. Mm. And so then we started to do experiments on that to impact sleep as well. But this is the driver. This is that part of the brain that you can't reach directly, but this is the part that we can reach through the magnetic uh, effects affecting both the biofield and the what's called the DC perineural system, the glial network of cells that can ultimately, you know, impact or influence this area. So when he reaches for like a sleeping pill, I think when I was giving my TED talk a number of years ago, the statistic was one third of adult Americans take some sort of sleeping medication because they have trouble going to sleep. So a over-the-counter or a pharmaceutical sleeping medication, you're saying like it doesn't really reach that part of the brain that your system can reach. Yeah, most sleeping pills operate at this level. And, and they're really, you know, they're called sleeping pills, but in essence, they're sedatives. Mm -hmm. They're just changing this. So they're not producing normal sleep. You know, when, when we came up with our technology and got it to the point where it was, you know, working to a degree, we immediately went into a sleep lab because we wanted to see, are we producing normal sleep? And sure enough, you know, when we turned it on and we had these people in, in the lab during nap studies in the morning after they've had a full night's sleep, so they shouldn't be falling right back to sleep. What we saw is they immediately started to get drowsy. There were slow rolling eye movements associated with drowsiness. We could watch their brain waves they drifted off into light sleep, and then uh, they ultimately went into deep sleep. And again, we were only using frequencies that affect this area of the brain, not brainwave frequencies. So we were actually producing sleep the way it normally occurs, unlike producing a sedative effect of the cerebral cortex. Nice, and so how would you use it for rel relaxation? Like during the day, if I wanna, I'm at my desk, I work from home, or I want to meditate, or I just got home from a stressful day and I just want to like 
relax. I don't want to drink alcohol. I don't want to sit in front of the television, but I want to like, I want to get into parasympathetic. We recommend, um, it, again, if you have the time and the ability, and let, let's say you're working from home, which would be ideal in this situation, use it late morning or early afternoon so that it doesn't interfere with your night's sleep. Okay. And use it with the settings that presumably are working for you already. And what you want to do is you want to go through that process that we discussed earlier about feeling. Okay. Immediately. Am I feeling it? Is it moving up my body? How much more can I encourage it so that I can feel more and more of that feeling at the same time, what you'll find is as you're feeling that feeling, it may either relax you so much that you fall asleep <laughs> or, you know, you get to the point where you adjust to it and you just enjoy that feeling and de-stress. And, you know, if you want, you know, the app will show you what your stress level is at that point and what your pulse rate is. So you can actually see it falling, you know, and I wouldn't recommend doing that. I, I, I think you just leave it alone and pay attention to how you feel. All right. I think that's the most important thing to do is focus on your feeling, learn how to encourage it. Once you get good at recognizing that feeling, particularly when it spreads to throughout most of your body, then you could do what you were just suggesting. I can do this while I'm working. Yeah. I can be going through emails. I can put this by my feet. And all I have to do is turn on, periodically just tune into my body to feel that sensation and you'll be very relaxed at that point. And, and th that's, what, uh, that's what I do um, when I want to use it during the day. Uh, I'll, I'll typically do it when I'm you know, working at my computer. I'll just turn it on for half an hour or an hour, depending on how I feel, and just let it do its thing. But I have to make sure that I don't do it late in the afternoon because it will de-stress me to the point where I won't need as much sleep at night and I'd rather have my, my night sleep consolidated. And I also would recommend not doing it when you're in a really important meeting because I, <laughs> I do work from home and I was in a meeting and it was the first time I tried the relax setting at work because I brought it down from my bedroom, I put it under my desk and I turned it all the way to 100%. So there's like a, a relaxation setting, like 100. If I turn it to 100, and I'm, I'm trying to tune into this meeting and I'm like, okay, I'll just be relaxed during the meeting. Well, I was just like zoning out during this meeting and I was like, oh my God, I'm way too relaxed <laughs> to even participate in this meeting right now. So yeah. I think there's, uh, you gotta be careful of that too. Yeah we, some yeah, we sometimes do that in company meetings where we're, we're all on Zoom and we've got it by us and we see which one's gonna fall asleep first. Exactly, it's a great benefit. So the, the name Dan, Soltech, like is, does our soul need technology? Like, what's, what's where'd the name come well, from? Well, well, you know, in my opinion, yes. I mean, this biofield, I think it's a, an interesting topic in and of itself. But the reason we call it Soltec, S-O-L, not S-O-U-L, is, you know, we think this is a primary technology that people should use. Mm. You know, this is, again, 75 to 90%, you know, illnesses caused or worsened by stress. So we think if we can get rid of stress or lessen it to a significant degree, that changes healthcare. I mean, that'd be massive. Like it, it seems like the two things that keep popping up on like what gives you optimal health or what takes away from your health the most. And it's stress and it's sleep. And it's almost like you can't, I mean, based on what I'm hearing you say, you almost can't separate those two things. You can't because they're so intertwined. It's, it's like the two strands of DNA. You, you can't separate them at all. And one affects the other. And that's why they're the number one and two, you know, consumer healthcare topics. So if you get somebody who's a, a sleep doctor or a sleep influencer, let's say, and all they're pushing is sleep, and this is why sleep is so important. Here's all the studies that tell you what happens when you don't get enough sleep and what happens when you do. And someone else is saying the same thing, but about stress. And really like if you're super stressed, you're not going to get all the benefits of the sleep. So I just, I don't see any way to separate them. And one of the reasons why like the technology you have is so important is like it knows, I mean, you guys know that that is that intertwine of the stress and sleep is so important and it addresses like both of those issues. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is we as a company now, are we're trying to figure out 
should we be proposing uh, um, a process whereby when somebody gets a device, they don't even start by using it for sleep. You know, maybe they take the first two to four weeks and focus on stress reduction so that they can feel it and learn what that feels like and then move to sleep. And in the beginning, when they go to sleep, it's like they already know what it feels like at this point. That's really interesting. And so then they could immediately get in bed and say, all right, I'm going to feel my feet because again, it's on right by, you know, it's under the bed, you know, by your feet. I can feel that. I can feel it move through my body. They're going to be much more apt to fall asleep at that point. Okay. Because I would say like most people, they're just like, I want to get a good night's sleep, put me to sleep and wake me up when it's morning so I don't have to think about it. So most people are going to look at this and be like, sleep solution, I'm taking it for that. But you're suggesting start with the stress part, even if it's only for a week or so, so that you can start feeling what the sensations are. And when you use it for sleep, it'll be that much more effective. Is that yeah. accurate? It, it's very accurate. And the reason, the reason people look at this technology and say, oh, that's a sleep machine, is because they value sleep more than they value a reduction in chronic stress. You know, Every, you know, everybody has chronic stress. The question is, to what degree? And so if you can conquer stress, you're really doing most of what you need to do to fix sleep. Sounds like it. Right? You know, the other, the other big reason people consider sleep to be more important than stress is because it's something that they're acutely aware of. Because they, they, there's a big difference between sleep and wake. Stress, on the other hand, they get so used to be, you know, to experience stress that they don't think it's any different. Mm. And as a result, you know, they don't consider it as a cause of, of the problems they're having. That's huge. I think that's just like that's that steady state and you get used to whatever state is persists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's uh, it's a it's a big deal when you get dropped into more of a parasympathetic. That's when a lot of people say, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize how stressed I really was until you get them to that parasympathetic state. Absolutely. And, and what's so important about that is once they can start living in that state and they start becoming a little bit more stressed, they go, wait, time out. Mm -hmm. Know how to avoid this. And then they can put themselves back into a state that's more parasympathetically driven so they have less stress, they are more healthy, and they are more apt to sleep well that night too. Definitely. So Dan, knowing what you know about stress and sleep, like what would you say you know and want to convey to people that most influencers and people in the, in the media either don't know or aren't telling people? I, I, I think it's what we've been discussing in terms of the importance of stress as, as not only how it affects disease, but how it affects sleep and, and that that should be the most important factor discussed. Right now, I think if you were going to rank the two, most people would say sleep is more important than stress. I mean, yeah. look at it this way. When, when people talk about the three pillars of health, it's always, it, it used to be, you know, diet, exercise, sleep. Yep. Now, with the press that sleep has gotten, they say, well, you know what? Sleep probably belongs up at the top. It's probably sleep diet and exercise. Right. Where's stress? <laughs> not even on it's, not, it's not even one of the three pillars. Yeah. You know, it, 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 there should be four pillars and it should lead with stress. What, um, what do you think dreams are, Dan? Oh, dreams are, you know, there are a lot of people more qualified to, to discuss dream sleep than I am. I'm asking you what you think dreams are. Why, why do we dream? What's the, what, what, what are we doing? Um, I think what we're doing, I think there's a couple of things. Okay. One is we are working through our issues. So, you know, as you said, we are consolidating memories. Yep. And what do those memories refer to? Okay. That we're having. Are they, memories that revolve around some of our coping strategies, for instance. And, and that's really important. So, you know, dream sleep is like our personal therapist. Yeah. 
You know, are there things I have to understand about my dreams that relate to issues I'm having during life? And, and oftentimes there's a symbolic representation which makes it difficult for most people to understand what this dream is trying to tell me. Mm. Okay, that's, that's, uh, it's really hard for a lot of people. Um, and it's not their fault, it's just, it's just really difficult. You have to be a, sort of an abstract thinker to say, you know, oh, this rock has to do with, I'm too solid, I don't wanna move. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, I mean, there's so much symbology in dreams, it makes it difficult. But, you know, other times, if you're dreaming about something that's more concrete, then it can be very easy to say, oh, yeah, I had this argument with this person and I was dreaming about argument, you know, arguing. And so, you know, whose fault was it? How much of this is my fault? How much do I want to own and accept? And where's my place in fixing this? All right. So that that becomes very important. And so, so, again, one element relates to one's psychology and, and the coping strategies that they've developed in order to live their life as they have. That's a, that's a huge part of sleep. Then there's another part that I'm fascinated about, and that is, you know, I like to use uh, sleep in general as a time when I receive answers, and that's usually during dream sleep. So what I'll do is I won't make a list of things I have to solve. I, I generally know what I have to solve, so I don't, I don't need to make a list. But what I'll often do is I'll create a bunch of questions that center around a particular topic, and I'll say, I really want to know the answer to this. I, I'm, I'm grappling with these issues, and where's the answer? And this is the difference between thinking to solve an issue and knowing, okay? Knowing is more of a felt sense. It's a gut level, it's throughout you. And oftentimes when I do that, I'll wake up in the morning out of a dream. I won't remember the dream, but I'll know the answer. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's an aspect and you have to ask yourself, well, how does that work? Is that the brain doing it? You know, maybe it is. Or do we really have a higher self and is that higher self communicating with us, you know, at that time? And, you know, it's still, it's still what we are, but it's, it, that's not part of my normal conscious awareness during the day when I'm trying to come up with these things. Mm. Sometimes it can be if I'm, let, let's say, in a meditative state, you know, then I can be in that state and be receptive. But I have to be open to that for those things to occur. Yeah, it seems like the brain is a receiver and a processor like it's receiving this information from this field and it's rendering it in some way for your senses to make sense of where we are but it's not the mind and it's not it's not where things come from it's where things come to well and i and i think i, I think mind i mean you you obviously know the term mindfulness mm -hmm. well okay what does that really mean it, does that mean there's like two minds and one part of the mind is mindful of the other part of the mind. And why do I want it to be full? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and I, w I would say, yeah, you know, it is something like that. And so I think, the, I think the mind of our egoic self is essentially that which is derived from the brain. Mm -hmm. So the brain processes, the brain develops beliefs, mm -hmm. okay? Most of our beliefs aren't true, you right. know, but we hold on to them. And we also develop all these coping strategies, these defense mechanisms, you know, so that we can cope with life and know how to respond. And so I would say that's the egoic mind, the lower mind. And then I think we do have a spiritual self and that's the higher mind. And how much of that is manifest in your conscious awareness? But that's the part that looks at the other part and says, you know, I don't think you're thinking about this the right way. <laughs> I, I think you need some adjustment. And so the question you, you mentioned, receptivity. If you can make this lower mind more receptive to the higher mind, then that information can flow. Mm. And I think that flows, I think it flows in, in all stages of sleep, but predominantly in dream sleep. So write down your questions before sleep and then rem either write down or remember your dreams or you just have these new thoughts when you wake up. You didn't know it was from right. the REM sleep, the dream sleep. Right, and that's, that's what happens with me. I, I, 
I, I'll sometimes know that I just woke up out of a dream. I won't remember the dream, but I'll have the knowing in exactly. terms of the answers. I thought that's what um, Thomas Edison would do, right? He would hold these like ball bearings in his hands and sit down in a chair to kind of meditate or he probably didn't get enough sleep. So he would fall asleep with these questions yeah. in his mind. And when the balls hit the ground because he fell asleep, he would wake up and have answers to his questions. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like he was trying to hack the system. Yeah. Sometimes he did that. Sometimes he just held a pencil between his, his thumb and the same thing would happen. And then that would wake him up and he'd go, okay, that's the answer. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. <laughs> I don't know that that's that easy for everybody. So are, is there anything else, um, Dan, that people should know either about the technology or stress before, before we go? I think, I think people need to take a look at themselves and compare how they are now to how they were as a child, particularly during happy times that were relatively carefree. Now, there are some people who obviously were abused as children, and that was very unfortunate and, and problematic. But for you know, those people that weren't, you know, childhood was a time where there was less stress, typically. And think back on those times and say, why am I not that way now, and how can I get back there? I think that's pivotal, because if you can move back to that time, your life will change. If you can find a way to acknowledge the issues you have, the stressors that are in your life and what you can do about them, prioritize those things, learn how to deal with them, um, I, I think it's, it's a, a game changer. But the, the other thing I would say is, although we've developed technology to address these issues, there's oftentimes a lot more that's required because you may become aware of these issues, but sometimes you'll need help in working through how to solve them. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing wrong, you know, with seeing a therapist or a coach or, you know, having deep discussions with those that are, you know, loved ones or people that are close to you to help get to the bottom of these issues. Very powerful. Especially for me, I went through something very similar. I was not getting sleep, a lot of insomnia. And until I went through a coaching program myself to be a coach, I had to spend nine months talking to other coaches. And they're like, your issue is anxiety, go. And like we, it was every week for two hours. And we had to talk about all these kind of intimate things. It made a huge difference. Yeah. And I think that, that along with some of the technologies that I implemented in my life, made a massive shift in my own sleep. So yeah. that's the key is like, it's not always just going to be one thing, but the technologies can really help. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the technology will help you realize that, oh, I can achieve these things. But, you know, what will be interesting is, you know, we've had some um, customers that have used the technology and have gotten remarkably better. And they get to a point where they're afraid to go forward because they're bumping into their issues. And that's when they need to go get that extra help. Definitely. Yeah, I love that. Dan, thanks so much for, for being here with us today and, and describing the technology, but also just all the things that go with it. The, the stress, you know, everyone seems to be more stressed and more anxious and have insomnia, but it's still not rising to the top. It's still like in the culture today, it's still sleep. So I love the discussion about stress and like how do we bubble that up and then how do we solve that? So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. If you want to be a corporate escape artist, head on over to howtoescapecorporate.com and sign up for the How to Escape Corporate Without Leaving Your Job course. Learn the exact methods to go from employee to entrepreneur. Turn your corporate existence into a corporate wonderland. It's time to take action. Howtoescapecorporate.com. Remember, members get the full-length podcast over at howtoescapecorporate.substack.com. Com. Become a member for $8 a month for the full podcast and members only articles and videos.